test flying a brand new aircraft. Things will go haywire at some point. Task-based flight test series. Please welcome your host from Clear Direct, Steve Cox. You've probably heard by now that you can flight test your experimental amateur-built aircraft in a way more efficient and effective way, rather than simply proving to the FAA that you won't crash for 40 hours. Well, as lucky timing would have it, I am one of the first builders to have completed the new task-based flight test program, newly authorized by the FAA, and I captured everything, so I'm excited to announce my brand new series, simply titled the Task-Based Flight Test Program. Now, most of those tasks will have their own individual episodes. So while I am a first time home builder, I'm not a first time test pilot, but most of my test pilot experience was in fighters in the Air Force. So we've both got a lot to learn and I'm super excited to learn along with you. Like I said, I've been capturing a ton of video content, but also telemetry content, which I'm going to parse through and we're going to debrief each one going through that telemetry and building an aircraft operating handbook as required by the new task-based flight test program. And I'll be releasing each of these episodes as I finish editing them over the next few months. So the chronology will be a little bit different. I like to tell stories in the typical arc, but these won't. These episodes likewise will be segmented. I'll pull potentially test runs from different flights. So if it jumps around, I apologize. I'll try to keep it very task-based. And hopefully we won't all be tumbleweed. I'll make it as least disorienting as possible. You'll see me in the backcountry and going to air shows and whatnot, probably before the end of the task-based series finishes up. All right, what this series is not. First of all, it is not the end-all be-all how-to step-by-step to test fly your aircraft. Now, if you're building an S21, RANS S21 outbound, then of course it'll be a little bit more applicable. Okay, but it is also not the only way to do flight tests, right? You have a lot of leeway, so build your own test cards. But if you want to jump start and see how I do it, then obviously follow along. In fact, you can absolutely still do the 40 hour fly off if you choose to. All right, what this series is, again, I'm a first time home builder writing my own test plan, relying on kind of old and draft EAA test cards. I'm interacting with them and giving them feedback, so hopefully we'll get version 2.0 of the, the test cards out soon. Um, I'm relying on my friends giving me their experience, so thank you guys. I've also got input from Mike Bush, from Randy Schlitter, from Colonel Rave Keithley. I've also got cameos by Kathy Page, champion stole drag racer, was just in the hangar a couple days ago, and much more. It's going to be a lot of fun. Look, flight test is not new. We're not reinventing the wheel here, but again, we're, we're learning and you know this airplane isn't a brand new design it's actually relatively new but let's face it I'm not Chuck Yeager we're not Chuck Yeager we're not reinventing the wheel here now unless you're going off on your own you know new design good on you that's great but the the process is however new to us tinkers and of course first-time builders so invariably this process that I'm documenting will evolve over time. So I'm recording this in May, 2024. And again, it'll evolve and invariably improve over time. So take that with a grain of salt and keep in mind that this could be old. But in this series, I am using the best guidance available to me today in 2024, as well as the best avionics available to me today. And I am just blown away by the telemetry baked into these avionics, making the data analysis part of this whole series just an absolute joy. I'm super excited to, to nerd out with you guys. So as of now, the requirements to complete the task-based flight test program are moderately defined. You can find them in Advisory Circular 90-89 Charlie, and of course, we'll be going through each one in this series. But I want to point out that it does require you to write an AOH, Aircraft Operating Handbook, I think POH. As always, let me know in the comments if I can, you know, re-attack something, explain anything any better, or change my format as we're going along, because I'll be dropping these as I finish them, so I can definitely pivot. And that's what this, this series is fundamentally about, so learning and getting better. And that said, we'll spend a lot of time in the debrief at the end of each video, and hint, 
part of it is going to be my arm in a sling. I'm getting some surgery. That's why. Well, it happened. I had my throttle operator surgically transformed into a microphone holder, apparently. But in all seriousness, the surgery went awesome. In fact, I'm probably flying by the time you see this. But I wanted to add a little bit more texture to the motherhood of this series, right? So that in episode one, we can just kind of jump right in. You know the assumptions, you know the format. I'm gonna try to stick to kind of the standard fighter pilot format, which is brief execution and debrief, but there'll definitely be times when I stray from that format. And there'll be a reason, and I'll try to keep it as logical as I can to get to the main objective, which is to collect accurate data to ultimately build a quality POH. The baseline assumption I'm making for viewers of this series is that you're at least got your private pilot's license or have a general understanding of basic aerodynamics. Number two, you're a builder or have interest in potentially building your own airplane one day. Or number three, simply just an av geek but much as myself. So that being said, we're gonna get quite a bit more advanced from that level, but I promise to do my best to to boil it down and bring it back down to that that baseline level. I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence, but again, we gotta kinda gotta set a set a baseline for that. And please feel free if I don't meet that bar, then ask your questions in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. And of course I'll pivot and do better next time. So I'm in the US, so I'm operating using gallons, I'm using nautical miles per hour, I'm using feet, I'm using inches of mercury. Much just like the manufacturers, we're gonna be using pressure altitude. So think of that as essentially if you're flying around at 3,000 feet at 3012 altimeter setting, you dial that down to 299 or two, that brings your pressure altitude to 2,800 feet. That's what we're gonna be using because that kind of corrects for those variances in pressure. Lucky for me, this corrected or pressure altitude is one of those data log points in my Garmin telemetry. The Garmin telemetry is logged at a one hertz rate fixed. You can't change it. But if you have JPI, engine monitor, or Dynon system, they have variable rates. Dynon as much as 16 hertz, which is awesome. You can crank it up for a test and then crank it back down so you're not blowing up your SD card. But I found one hertz on the Garmin to be, to be adequate. We really unlock the magic of the telemetry when we import it into Savvy Analysis free web-based tool. It's a little bit hard to find since Savvy Aviation is a for profit business. So of course they put their paid services up front and center. So I'll leave the link in the description to their free analysis tool. And I got to thinking, why do they offer this for free? Why don't they charge for this? Because it is so incredibly valuable and I am not affiliated in any way, but I posed this question to Mike Bush, aviation legend and author and founder of Savvy Aviation. And he got back to me with some really sound points. So I'll reveal those answers in an upcoming episode in this series. And this is where YouTube wants me to ask you to hit that subscribe button. It's a little bit cringe. So I'm just gonna ask you to go ahead and verify that you're subscribed so you don't miss any episodes. Moving on. So of course, many of you are familiar with my build series. How, how do it work? I don't know. It works like this. So oh. You go left, you go left. <laughs> Thanks for watching. But again, kind of baseline, I want to assume that you know anything about this build or this airplane. So welcome to my new viewers. Uh, let's reset. Okay, I built a Rans S21 outbound. Uh, I've got airframe number 170 for a number of months. I didn't know what airframe I had. I figured it was kind of baked into the serial number. In fact, it is. The four, first four digits of the serial number are the month and year of which that airframe was produced at the factory. Mine was produced in March of 2021. And then the last four digits are your number of airframe of the S21 they, that they built. They're currently up to number 382. So doing some math, that's an average of 67 S21s per year. So most of them are experimental amateur built kits that builders build like I did. Some of them are SLSA models that they build at the factory, lighter gross weights, comply with the LSA rules. A few lucky customers have been able to get experimental amateur built uh, aircraft produced by the factory. I've got a friend, Matt, who's got one that's a pretty amazing aircraft. As you can tell, it's pretty standard configuration for a high wing tail dragger. I've got 180 horsepower Continental Titan XIO 340. So experimental injected opposed 340 cubic inches. And I've got dual electronic ignition on the thing. It's pulled around by a two blade carbon whirlwind 82 cub propeller that is ground adjustable. After the engine, the airframe is constructed primarily of 6061 T6 aluminum uh, with the exception of a steel powder coated 
frame that goes from the firewall aft, including the engine mount, of course, but then the firewall aft to station four, which is the trailing edge of the wing. Everything aft of that, no kidding, is all aluminum. So unlike the Kit Fox, unlike the Rans S20 that has the tubes that go all the way to the tail, the steel tubes that go to the tail, this is 100% aluminum aft of station four, which I think is pretty cool. Saves on weight, still really, really strong, and there's no fabric, there's no wood. So that's one of the reasons why I got this airframe. Now, most of the rivets are pulled old dome head rivets so it reminds you kind of like a vans rv12 so it goes together really really fast there are some flush rivets uh, where it counts right leading edge of the wing etc speaking of the time that i put in to build this kit that the factory advertises a thousand hours i think you could do that if you're an experienced builder not filming <laughs> yourself the entire way, potentially if you contract out the, the avionics harness. I chose to, to learn how to wire up and design the harness all myself. So that definitely took some time and elbow grease, but I'm super happy with how it turned out and it was very rewarding. In fact, probably the, the most rewarding part of the entire build. The only part of the build that I did contract out was the paint. I was lucky, super lucky, that Mirko Pecorari took me on as a client. He's a legendary aircraft livery designer out of Modena, Italy. Of course, there's episodes, so you can go ahead and watch those if you want. I'll just say that we had this really, really cool way of designing this, this airplane via virtual reality. So I put on the VR goggles, I stood next to Mirko from Modena, Italy to Bend, Oregon, and we were standing in the same virtual space and looking at the plane and picking paint jobs. But it was so much fun and I got along with Mirko so well I had to fly out to Modena where he was such a great host and showed me the Enzo Ferrari Museum. In fact, he worked with John Todd and the Formula One team. Once we had that design, then I'm, again, super lucky that I have just a world-class paint shop here at Bend, Oregon, Cascade Customs and Design. They grew up with the Lancer, work with Epic and, and Stratus Jet and other Mirko designs as well. So they're familiar with how he outputs his cut files and, and I think they produced a gem. It's definitely a unique paint scheme. It's not for everybody. I realize it, I love it. I wouldn't change a thing about the, the paint scheme. I would be a little bit more careful. There's a few scratches we're working out right now. While my arm is in the sling, I took my elevator and we're touching up some items. Back to flight test. The place to start is read cover to cover advisory circular 90-89 Charlie. Make sure it's Charlie because that's the newest version that unlocks this task-based flight test program. And again, you can still execute the 40-hour flight test should you desire. The next place I would go is the EAA website. Order these two items. These are the EAA flight test manual as well as the test card book. They are currently on version 1.1. I have a draft copy of version 2.0 that they're working on. If you're impending like my buddy Randy is about to test fly his airplane, passed his airworthiness inspection, congratulations. But if you're at that phase, go ahead and buy these now. Don't wait, okay, because they're a huge help. Hopefully we'll get uh, version 2.0 out real, real soon. Sure, you could take the factory numbers for VX, VY, for instance, go airborne, validate them, and quickly pencil whip a POH and be on your way. But I would encourage you to dig a bit deeper and really ring out your airplane for two main reasons. One, there's gonna be variations build to build. You know that. Number two, and almost more importantly, is it allows you an opportunity to really build a bond with that airplane and really understand the handling qualities and the performance characteristics. So I'd encourage you to do that for what it's worth. All right, back to pre-op Steve, back at the hangar. So listen guys, I really hope you enjoy this series as much as I've enjoyed putting it together and am still very actively putting it together. And I just wanna let you know that after this series, Clear Direct is pretty much gonna pivot into primarily backcountry adventures. I hope that's all right with you. So come out west, fly with me in Idaho this summer. I'm gonna spend a ton of time in Idaho and also Oshkosh. So see you there. Till next time, it's Steve, your Clear Direct. <laughs>